Welcome to Talking Pictures. My name is Christian Gensel. I'm a filmmaker and film journalist from Salzburg, Austria. Talking Pictures is a podcast series in which I talk to the people who made some of my favorite movies. Today's guest is Brian Leslie, producer of the found footage horror film The Black Door, which came out in 2001 on the heels of the success of the genre-defining The Blair Witch Project. The Black Door was directed by Kit Wong, and Brian Leslie was brought on board by his production partner Lucas Lowe. Lowe, best known as the director of martial arts action films like King of the Kickboxers and American Shaolin, had worked with Brian on a horror mystery anthology series which was originally called The Legends of the Bushwalker and was then renamed Diaries of Darkness, with Lowe as director, Brian Leslie as producer, and both as creators and writers. There is an interesting and somewhat ironic connection between The Legends of the Bushwalker and The Blair Witch Project, but I'll leave it up to Brian to tell the story. Both Lowe and Leslie then worked on The Black Door, the creepy story of an investigation into the mysterious background of a severely wounded hospital patient, which leads to an old satanic sect. And one of the film's highlights is a found 8mm film of a ritual performed in the 1930s, which easily counts as one of the most effective set pieces in the history of found footage. In our conversation, Brian discusses his background as a producer, the development of The Legends of the Bushwalker, and its surprising connection to the film which kickstarted the first wave of found footage horror back in 1999. He talks about the making of The Black Door and its individual elements, including a haunted house. And he relates a bizarre, frightening, and ultimately very sweet encounter during the production of The Black Door. The interview was conducted in connection with our German language podcast Lichtspielplatz. So if you speak German, please visit lichtspielplatz.at and check out episode number 68, which features an in-depth discussion of The Black Door and many other found footage horror films. Also, make sure to listen to our interviews with found footage directors Dean Aliotto, Stefan Avalos, Ted Nicolaou and Ron Bonk here on Talking Pictures. If you enjoy my conversation with Brian Leslie, please visit TalkingPicturesPodcast.com to check out more interviews and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So without any further ado, here is producer Brian Leslie. So before we talk about the Black Door um, in detail, um, I was hoping you could give us a little bit of background um, on how you became interested in film and how you became involved with film with the production side of things. Okay, well, um, basically what it was, was um, I was a cop for 15 years. I decided to leave policing. I took my son, we went to Los Angeles. Um, I originally was looking to kind of get into the film industry in one way or another capacity or another. I did some uh, um, training in the, uh, um, as an actor first, and then I got an opportunity to get involved with um, uh, film when I was in New York. Now, when I was in New York, I started producing off-Broadway. And lo and behold, what happened was I put a, a notice out for a uh, director and uh, for stage, actually. And um, I ran into, had, had a meeting with Lucas Lowe, who uh, ultimately became my director. He thought he was actually um, interviewing for a position as a director Uh, on film in New York, but it was, it turned out to be, it was uh, on stage. And so him and I got, got off into a conversation. And as a result of that, we kind of formed a company ourselves and went to Los Angeles and uh, began, uh, he taught me basically the film side of things. I was producing already off Broadway. So at the time, so I was quite business savvy anyway. And, uh, I just learned how to produce and uh, he directed uh, in Los Angeles. And that's how we started uh, um, doing a, a, a segment we called um, uh, Legends of the Bushwalker, which was in fact the pilot for Diaries, which was renamed in 2000 to Diaries of Darkness. Were you familiar at all with uh, Lucas Lowe's work as a director um, before you uh, teamed up with him? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because when he gave me his his CV, um, automatically there was a lot of action films on it. Um, King of the Kickboxer, American Shaolin, uh, uh, Blood Brothers, uh, those type of films. And basically uh, at that point, uh, I knew he was an action director. Um, he worked out of Shaw Brothers out of Hong Kong. 
and that's how he ended up coming to uh, to New York. So that's that's how we connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems to be a quite a, a change of pace for him um, to go from you know martial arts movies to sort of mystery and, and and horror movies. How did you become interested in in mystery and horror? Well, generally speaking, I grew up with uh, watching the Twilight Zone. I always was fascinated by the the writing of the Twilight Zone that it wasn't necessarily an outright horror, but it had kind of a sci-fi element to it. And the it was more of thriller, sci-fi, and a little bit of horror. But there was an intelligent writing style to it, which I liked. And so as a result of that, I started actually writing um, for Diaries, which originally was what I started writing for. And um, between myself and Lucas, uh, he would do the storyboards for it. And so I could see what the writing looked like prior to even shooting. So that's where we went with that. And the story of, of Diaries definitely has a, a Twilight Zone flair to it, I think. Um, I, I think the film is currently unavailable. So maybe you can t uh, just tell us a little bit about um, what the story was and, and what that series was supposed to be. Well, the series, um, well, the, the series based on the pilot was Legends of the Bushwalker, which changed into uh, Diaries in mm -hmm. 2000. But um, it was a story about um, basically a a uh, brake salesman that had gone on a trip and he had originally in his past had uh, in a hit and run had killed two young boys and on the train and we shot on Disney Ranch uh, Sable Ranch in Los Angeles on a train there which they had two parts of the train and one of them we created as kind of a horror train uh, very dark in the uh, per for the purposes of uh, color correction was very kind of purpley black type darkness in there and there's lots of cobwebs in that side of it but the normal train had a lot of extras in it and we shot um on the train with the conductor and the conductor when um the uh robert apisa played um um uh, played taylor um and he played in things like uh, executive decision and these types of films he was also a partner in the company eventually but we um had shot on the train he falls asleep and in his sleep, he ends up what he believes is a nightmare. He's in this now this car, this train car where he wakes up and he's the only passenger and he's not going to Appleton anymore. Um, he's going to a different town and the conductor is now more of a zombie like character. Um, and when he wakes up, he um, he asks, well, where are we going? And he says, um, I can't remember the actual name of the town he was going to, but uh, uh, it was different than Appleton anyway, and it was kind of a dark uh, town. And he then wakes up and he says, uh, you know, he says, well, I was going to Appleton. He says, he says, this train doesn't go to Appleton. It was, and the train actually goes to um, this town, which is in a, in a third dimension. Um, so he basically ends up having, and the kids come back and meet him on the train and they get him to confess to what he had done and repent for his sins. Um, and basically the, the, that's what the series of the first episodes about. Um, and then when he wakes up, he's trying, we cut back to the actual train and Taylor is sleeping, but the conductor tries waking up and he's passed away. And it was during that period of time, that transition where he's actually having a heart attack and he's, uh, his life is flashing before him prior to death. And that's what the that's what the episode's about. So the the um, episodes that you didn't produce, the episodes that would have followed, uh, would they have been set on the train too, or would have been no, different no, scenarios with always with that sort of transition between life and death? That's correct. Yes, all the other episodes were various ones. Um, where uh, for one of them, I remember the individual goes into um, this individual is a guy's driving down a highway he turns off he sees a, a, a town that he needs to go get gas and he goes into this town and it's a ghost town and the place is being run by zombie kids so the whole town the whole town is very different um almost zombie-ish type character kids they run hotels they do everything and it's a it's a most of a ghost it's a ghost uh town that's another one that was there so Mm -hmm. How many episodes did you did you consider? Well, I wrote I wrote about five episodes, um, 
and we sold that concept to a private um, um, individual that was going to um, wanted to buy them out. So we had co covered our cost back. It never, I don't know what happened to it after that. I don't know if they kept the name. Uh, we kind of sold it off and, and then Lucas um, had uh, gone to Hong Kong and never came back. We never heard from him ever again. Cool. So there was kind of a, and he had the, he had the footage of my first one. So basically that's where it ended up with him. So uh, I had a copy, but that got lost in some moves over a period of time. Cause it's, you're, you're going back to, you know, to 1999 to 2000, 2002, where he, he left. So we're going back some years. I haven't done um, film since that, except for I had developed a series, uh, which I'm just developing during during the pandemic called the transition hole, mm -hmm. which is very similar to um, diaries is picking up where diaries left off. And it, but it's, it is a, a very similar um, uh, series written yeah. the same way. So I'm hoping this will be a chance to um, produce the stories that you're talking about, because uh, I mean, it really sounds like a cool concept. I would really love to see the pilot and um, I, I think the like the additional episodes that you're talking about that sounds like a really cool series so um, it seems that a couple of people have seen the the diaries of darkness or the legend of the bushwalker because a couple of people have actually given it a rating uh, on imdb uh, but just a very small handful of people so i don't know yeah. if it... and it's very possible it's very possible because we did give um when we did the final copy of it the edited copy of it um we did give copies to several people in the crew um just people in general of the of the pilot itself so it's very possible mm -hmm. so, so you never know what people do they don't pass it on i'm surprised it hasn't been uploaded at some point mm -hmm. to it because youtube wasn't back then um it was called broadcast.com when the internet first started and uh now youtube it's uh you know it's easy just to find stuff because you can upload it so maybe somebody who's listening to our conversation would, um, you know, sort of remember the film and um, remember that he has it in his basement or in his attic. And, um, you know, we would really love to see it. Uh, please upload it on YouTube or, you know, just contact us. And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I know there was a final there was a final copy after going through the, the process of uh, editing and uh, the, the full production was completed. Um, and it was actually we did. Um, we did have a full copy of the final product. Um, once it was done, music was attached. Uh, um, but like I say, I Lucas had the masters and everything. And we had some of it at Deluxe Labs out of Los Angeles um, in there. I have never gone back to check. Um, I think we took all of our stuff out of there. That's why I never bothered checking. But, uh, mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, this kind of the way things worked is that uh, it was a very expensive um, a very expensive uh, pilot. I think the budget was anywhere from three hundred and fifty thousand to almost uh, four fifty. So wow, yeah. So it was pretty uh, because it shot on thirty five. It was uh, you know we did a, f a full week shooting. We had uh, you know stars on board on the series itself um, on diaries. Uh, so we had um, you know uh, people that you know we paid pretty good money for. So it's. Uh, um, but that's why I started the uh, the transition hole, which was a very uh, similar concept, uh, except for the difference is, is that, and in fact, I had, as we discussed, uh, I had uh, um, done a, a, an opposite, an uh, alternate ending to Bushwalker, which ultimately was um, Taylor Van Witsby reappears once again in the, in the first segment of mm -hmm. uh, the transition hole. Which hasn't been shot yet. Just the the pilots on YouTube right now, um, but it it actually um, where he comes um, into a situation where um, he goes into a uh, the two kids once again um, end up in in death. They get hit by a car. They are now in a transition hole, which is between death and life. And their duty their their duty is to and their purpose now is to decide the fate of others who have either wronged other people or themselves in the pilot um, for for um, transition hall Taylor Van Witsby ends up back down on the uh, and being judged by them and it's mm -hmm. a different ending to it 
because what ends up happening is um, they end up playing a game um, in the transition hole where he has to, um, he has certain questions he has to answer truthfully and he thinks he's pulling one over on the kids and it turns out that he wins, but he gets to live, but he lives in infinity and has to re, um, relive. Uh, he becomes uh, irrelevant. He'll have no friends and he starts again from where he is. And when he dies, he keeps repeating himself for infinity. And that's, that's what he ends up with this time instead of full death. So it's a little different, but uh, I rewrote it just for the sake of the transition hole. And these are all much like this now. These kids will now determine um, the fate of others. And that was, uh, it was designed, uh, the transition hole was actually started uh, writing in the um, uh, uh, pandemic only because I was limited to what I could do. So we did do some mock-ups and we did uh, do some stuff on uh, Zoom, which actually um, special effects we used on Zoom to see what it would look like on the opening. And you can see those on YouTube actually. Um, they're in the trailer that I put on YouTube. So you can see how the trailer is kind of uh, relates to a lot of the, um, what this, what the series, if I did it on, which we originally were going to do it on Zoom um, during the pandemic, but I'm now holding it until after this pandemic is over and it'll probably be shot uh, in a traditional way on film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, maybe a train situation and... Um... Well, it's a, they're in transition. So they're, they're in a kind of a dark, it's almost a space-like place. Mm -hmm. uh, and they end up in, it's between, uh, the transition hole is a place between life and death. And it's where people haven't died yet, but they haven't been determined where they're going yet. So this is, they either get sent back because they plead their case well, or they end up in a different place, like you saw the, in, the, in the pilot. Uh, episode a segment so the that's kind of where i'm going with that one so it's it mm -hmm. does work i think it's um there's some you know it was written for a kind of a zoom type situation with special effects and and you wouldn't have known by the time we finished it that it was zoom but that's kind of the way it was originally written because who knows how long the pandemic was going to go so that's how i was mm -hmm. writing it for that purpose now the first iteration of of um the story that you talked about, um, Legend of the Bushwalker, um, mm. has a very interesting uh, connection to um, the um, the other film that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll go into that. So okay. So basically, basically, what you're talking about is uh, um, in 1999. There's a lot of things people don't know about um, about Legends of the Bushwalker. It seems like a very irrelevant type film, but actually, what it was is Neil Fredericks was our cinematographer. And at the time when we were shooting in the Angeles forest, um, uh, Neil was, uh, we, uh, Lucas brought him in to basically hold the camera and do camera work with him as the, as the director. Um, and what it ended up happening, we were in the Angeles forest. It was during the, the uh, rainy season there and we had a lot of rain. So, um, but during that period of time, first couple of days, Neil was shooting. Um, and Lucas being a, uh, a real stickler for camera work because he's done so many action films, he can actually run full out um, uh, on his shoulder doing a shoulder uh, shoot and it, it looks just like uh, a steady cam. So he didn't like the way um, Neil was doing that. So he decided he was gonna pick up the camera from that point on. So we, what we ended up doing was we, I said to, you know, to Neil, I said, well, we're gonna go in a different direction with this. Uh, Lucas wants to run the camera himself because he feels the, your camera movement's a little bit shaky. Um, and he says, well, that's fine. I was actually gonna go afterwards and shoot with some friends of mine. And so we gave him a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars to, to do that, to kind of go to his project. It was a little supposed to be a student project of some sort. And later on, it wasn't until a year and a little bit later I had uh, known, I had been in my office in Los Angeles and I noticed this theater um, that there's this long line and I went down and was talking to people and they said, this is this film that is being shown in there and it's making people sick because of the shaky camera movement. And I said, I said, oh really? And I had no idea what, what he was talking, you know, what they were talking about. I thought this was kind of a, a very different concept. I'd never even heard of that before. 
And uh, it wasn't until about almost a year later, uh, Lucas and I were watching, um, we were watching uh, on TV and it turns out to be, it was the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> and, that's, and that's ultimately what made the Blair Witch Project very appealing in the beginning was the, the, the kind of very shaky kind of camera movement that was, you know, in the forest running this sort of thing. And uh, um, Lucas said, you see, I, I, he says, there you go. And I says, yeah, but that's what's making it a hit. <laughs> so that was the kind of the, the, uh, uh, the, the little thing that we, we never saw after that. And then uh, Lucas liked the smooth camera, but it turned out that, as you know, the Blair Witch Project did what it did. It's such an amazing story. I mean, it's such a coincidence in a way that um, yeah. just when you consider how influential the Blair Witch Project has become and um, sure. how much this aesthetic has really gone gone on to influence even the mainstream of Hollywood and um, sort of to, oh, to have the genesis there with uh, yeah. like Diaries of Darkness and somebody saying, well, that's not the style we're going for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you keep in mind going back in that time period, um, that was, you know, it was very hard. You never saw anything on video mm. in the film festivals or anything like that. It was all film shot. Um, so that was a new t trend that was just breaking through to begin with anyway. Uh, it Blair Witch created a whole different um, outlook on what film could be. Um, and I think it actually, at the end of it, it's, it sparked a lot of reality type TV shows too, mm. because it, they became sellable. Um, and low bu lower budgets than what film was. And that's, that was a huge difference back then. And um, I think that um, Blair Witch was uh, probably a really breakthrough type film and everything just fell in the line at, at, during that period of time. And that's why, um, you know, we, on my IMDB, I have, it is Diaries of Darkness, but the actual, um, and it's in 2000, but we changed the name from Legends of the Bushwalker, which actually shot in 1999 just before um, Blair Witch was shot. And that's why Neil Fredericks went from um, uh, Legends of the Bushwalker, it, it, named later as Diaries of Darkness, but um, onto, onto the Blair Witch Project and, and was very happy. And we, we left on great terms. I mean, Guy's a great guy. I didn't have a problem with him at all. But Lucas is a very, um, was a type of person that just wanted 100% smooth shooting. Mm. He wanted, he wanted a steady cam, but it wasn't about to. At those days, steady cams weren't that uh, prominent. You never used them. They, if they existed, we sure didn't. Uh, um, you know, as a producer, I was learning what equipment we had out there, and a lot of the uh, camera people, nobody used steady cams really. Uh, it was pretty much uh, three camera shots or, you know, standard camera, uh, shoulder mount, that sort of thing. Um, but for that purpose, uh, yeah, that's when uh, that's how. Neil ended up uh, on the Blair Witch. And needless to say that Blair Witch was, uh, you know, it was a pretty much, I think from what he had told me originally that it was gonna be a student thing, some friends of theirs were shooting something. And um, who was to know that, uh, you know, it would be kind of that kind of a horror thriller um, scenario. Um, mm. So, and, and, you know, getting back into where we go into the black door, if you see the concept of the Black Door, the Black Door was very similar to Blair Witch because it was after Blair Witch, and we shot this. Um, Kit Wong was the uh, was the director on uh, Black Door. That one was shot in uh, Vancouver, or just about forty miles out of Vancouver. And the story behind the Black Door is quite unique too because um, it was shot in a in a haunted house, um, mm -hmm. and the it was, a, it was basically a, um, uh, on, a, on a property where the actual house had, one of the houses we shot at was an abandoned house and had, was in the, known in the neighborhood as kind of a haunted house. It had been vacant for years. And um, it was known as the, I guess so the kids used to go there and it was a, kind of a, known as kind of a haunted house. Mm -hmm. So we shot there and it gives that look and feel very much so of a, uh, a haunted house. Uh, when they go in there and they shoot, we shot there. So um, that was quite an interesting project. That's the abandoned house in the long segment where he uh, goes with a video camera into the like the dark um, abandoned place where he's attacked by the demon eventually, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
yeah it's yes. a great, great and it, sequence and it's become such a such a staple in found footage films i think but here mm -hmm. it's a very early incarnation of that uh, of that idea of just exploring the darkness the unknown with a camera sure and and in that you've got to remember that that film itself was shot on 35 but it the segments that are back in 1920 which are the found footage segments were shot in eight millimeter um, and what was interesting in that film was it was a fairly large budget. It wasn't a cheap budget by no means. Um, the, the eyes that, um, there's a part in there where the eyes get slit. Um, and when you look at that, and that, that's on YouTube, you can still find it on YouTube, the black door. Um, the area there, the head that was recreated with, with, with prosthetics. And I remember as a producer, I remember that cost about $26,000, $27,000 just alone. And the actual eyeballs moved. They actually looked real. Mm. I was very surprised our, our special effects prosthetics person that we brought on created an amazing um, head that was just, uh, um, you know, it was a duplicate of the actor. And uh, it was, uh, and when you actually played with it before, they actually cut the eyes. And the eyes actually had... The, um, the fluids in them that, that an eyeball would have, that kind of similar fluid. And it was amazing how they recreated that. Um, and then when they slid it, it looked like it was real, like because the eyeballs were real, they, were, they looked real even when, before we did that. And uh, that, uh, the head was very much uh, uh, a talking head, we called it at that time. <laughs> Again, it's 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 a, such a great sequence. Um, the whole uh, eight millimeter sequence that you're talking about. I mean, it's it really goes under your skin. It's something that oh, yeah. um, really has an effect on the viewer. I think um, sure it does because it looks like real footage that might be found. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't. Um, it's there's a part of it that you just can't get. Um, it's very eerie. And even when it was shot, it was very eerie because it was we were shooting like at sometimes one in the morning. On the in this house, which was really creepy to begin with, um, so there was a lot of very very uh, unique elements to that that were um, that kind of just made you kind of shiver as you were as they were shooting, um, and there's also a lot of uh, a lot of expense paid for detail. For example, all the you see the the ledgers and records that they actually had mm -hmm. um, they they had in that film was. We actually had, and it was my job to locate um, people that are experts in that kind of writing back in the 20s, that we actually had them recreate and rewrite full ledgers. That was a very expensive, just, and there's only in a few shots. It's not even, but there was a lot of money put into that, that detail to make it real. Um, because when you look at the way, when they're looking at the ledgers uh, with all the different um, time period stuff, it's it goes back to that time and it was a lot of money was spent on that i mean it was incredible the budget that was uh, spent on that film and i think it really helps the reality um, of the whole thing especially since the whole found footage genre plays so much with the idea that it, it's basically real stuff that you're seeing i mean nowadays when we watch a film we've, we've become sort of aware that it's you know it's a genre and we don't believe that it's actual footage um but i think back in the days i remember that with blair witch project um there was a time when people actually thought that you know this is the remaining footage of uh, mm -hmm. those film students who went out there in the woods and died uh, well that, yeah and that was a brilliant marketing uh ploy too on their side because they they started it and keep in mind Everything kind of worked around the same time back then. You had the internet that just kind of started, started up not too long before that. So there wasn't a ton of stuff on the internet yet. Um, and so to get something looked at very quickly and by a lot of people didn't take much. Um, now it's, you have to have a lot of SEO to get you to, you know, and you have, have to, a lot of social media and this sort of thing. That stuff didn't exist back then. So you had... But you had a website that that basically got a lot of a lot of people looking at, and especially when they got you know a little bit of press on it, the issue then became um, this was now a um, this is now a real film that people found, and of course you know how rumors start. If this had been, I think if that had been shot in a time period today as a new film, never you know 
and not being in film, but being on video like it was, I think social media would have taken up, um, taken it up and it would have been a, uh, it probably would have been an investigation on it. <laughs> I would think at that point, because it's a, you know, you got a lot of the people that are, you know, have their opinions and of course, um, the rumor alone would would have created a huge buzz, and it created a huge buzz back then. I mean, I, I think I remember even like IMDb, which existed back then. I think they sure. listed the actors as deceased um, at some point for the Blair Witch Project. Could be, yeah, so. yeah, uh, yeah, that could be it. Yeah, I mean, it was it, it was incredible on the marketing side of it. I I was really, I, I was actually in awe of how they they went ab ab beyond anything that had been done there before and nothing, nothing had been done like that before. And they were the first, and that was one of the main things that they really, they really took off with. They recreated a real situation that people just didn't know because of the rumor um, that this was, this was real footage and they wanted to go see it. They wanted mm -hmm. to see this footage. And uh, like I said, and then of course people weren't used to at that time, um, you know, films like this in theaters, definitely. And because of the um, the shoulder running with the you know the the shaky camera movement, um, it really created that whole film. It became the the staple of why people went to see that. I think. I mean, there was lineups going back to you know to um, back when I remember it in the theaters, um, and they were around the block. And these you know independent theaters in Los Angeles that just um, there was lineups, and you know people were lining up for. The third, the third, um, the third showing, and they were going to—they were waiting through two two showings, just to see it, because rumor alone had got it, you know, out that much. So it was incredible. Yeah, absolutely amazing, and I think the success of Blair Witch uh, very much influenced uh, uh, the Black Door, right? I mean, oh, that was... I, for no, a hundred percent because. When we were told, when I was told, uh, Lucas was originally brought on by Kit Wong um, to produce this film, but he's not a producer. So he called me right away and he said, I've got this film I've got to produce and I have no idea how to produce. So I want to bring you on. And I said, okay, that's fine. I said, and they said, well, right away, we knew right away that this is what the company was looking for is um, to, to, compete with the Black, to compete with the Blair Witch Project because Blair Witch Project had already come out they wanted to be that that other company that you know produced a good film that was like the Blair Witch because it was kind of a genre film at that time. So yeah, definitely that's exactly why they did it. So had you seen uh, the Blair Witch at the point at that point when you were working on the Black Door? Um, I'm trying to think. I think I had. I think we had seen it on TV prior to this coming out. I did know. I did know that the footage in Blair Witch, though, I had seen some footage whether it was maybe a trailer or something, perhaps um, I had seen, but I had seen, I knew what it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what the timelines were because I know when we did the uh, black door. Um, yeah, I think we had seen it because we'd already identified that as being um, the film that, um, that uh, Neil had already been involved in. And so we were quite familiar with it. I think I'm pretty sure going back to that time period, that was the, the chronology of it is so tight because there was Legends of the Bushwalker. Um, Neil goes over to do a, a small little film with his friends, <laughs> which turned out to be a huge film with his friends. Um, and uh, on a very, very, a, a budget that you couldn't even imagine. You know, a lot of people talk about the rumored budgets of, you know, it was 10,000, 20,000. It wasn't, it was very, very, very minimal, very minimal. And, um, it, that's what made it work. Because if you remember, they did the second Blair Witch um, and they shot it on film. It didn't do nearly as well, um, only because it didn't have that that hook. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting that they, when they did the sequel, that they completely abandoned the whole found footage approach. Um, well, generally speaking, I mean, there were some films around that time which used the found footage um, mm -hmm. idea, but it only became such a trend, I think, many, many years later when films like um, 
uh, Paranormal Activity or REC came out. Um, and I read that the director of REC, um, Spanish director, Yaume Balaguerro, if I, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, he actually said that the Black Door is one of the inspirations for REC. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, and, and the Black Door was inspired by the Blair Witch. And so yeah. ultimately, um, but was, well, you know, I, I think the reason why when the black door because artesian picked it up right that's um the the um um the uh, blair witch project and um ultimately they're the ones that put the money into it to you know to transfer it on to 35 for theaters but the issue really was the um the second one they did i think people still hadn't got past the idea that this the as you say the found footage type films that shooting on that format was very, very hard for most companies to, to accept going into video. In fact, that's why I left the film industry because I shot on nothing but film um, during the time I was, uh, I was a producer and I did a lot of contract producing jobs on film too. Um, but I just, when film was no longer there, um, I just, I felt I was out of my element to a certain degree. I love film. I loved uh, producing film. I loved uh, budgeting film. I love selling it. Um, you know, I went to the markets and uh, had lots of experience there. Um, and I just, uh, I think I just thought my, my term as a producer was time to move on um, after it went into uh, video, which is a whole different, you know, a whole different realm. And now you look at back at uh, shooting today, we have you know, streaming, we have, you know, all sorts. I mean, now it's competitive to the studios. The studios are out of their element. They have no idea how to deal with this sometimes, I think, too. I think they're kind of in a, you know, let's wait and see. And what do we, what do we green light? I mean, we used to green light major motion picture. Now, what do we do? You know, Sequels you're doing, mainly. <laughs> yeah. And you're, you know, you're, you're green lighting um, because you're doing theatrical release, you know, and um, who's to say how long theaters are going to be there to begin with to be in. And if that's your model, um, you know, it was like the uh, Blockbuster video, you know, when Blockbuster had the video, they just couldn't accept the idea that the internet was going to be there to replace them. And they were in a great spot financially at the time when they, when they went under, they could have been the Netflix, you know, they could have had the Netflix, they had the the uh, the budgets for that, but I don't I, I don't know what happened there. But somebody didn't see the bigger picture, and and there was a lot of that going back into the time when the internet started. Not just in in film industry, but in businesses too that lost their business because they just couldn't accept that this is the new this is going to be the new future. Mm. And the ones that bet on the new future, um, like um, you know, like uh, um, Netflix. Um, you know, they saw it coming, they, they adapted to it and they used it to their advantage. And, and it was, um, and there was film companies though, but because right in that transition of 1999, 1998, um, 2000, 2001 was a transition period for film. It, it, it we, and if you think about it, you go back to um, even the, even the shows shot on um, sitcom, things like that, they were all three camera, uh, 35 mil format. Um, and they went to, you know, video. And of course there was a red camera and this sort of thing that, you know, that kind of transitioned a little bit into a film look on video where you could do a lot of more special effects, that sort of thing. And that transition was, was good. I think that transition worked well for a lot of people, but the film side of it, I think, um, people just couldn't wrap their heads around. They needed to see film on the big screens. Mm. And that was, I think, I think even, even after the Blair Witch established itself, that's why they went to, I, I, I'm going to guess that's why they went to film in the second one. Because they just, I mean, it was all, Blair Witch was in film too, but it was shot originally on video, then transferred into film. But the shooting on film just didn't have the same appeal and the same abilities to do certain things um, that they did in the Blair Witch uh, on the first one. And uh, as you know, the franchise itself has done very successful because the concept of the story was very good. And this idea of found footage was a huge deal. And then, I mean, it started that way. And that's interesting that you say that that as uh, a Spanish uh, director, um, mm -hmm. was you say Spanish director that he was influenced by the Black Door so um, because I know the Black Door did quite well in the foreign markets in uh, 
uh, Europe and and throughout there because mm -hmm. it was I think it it did a very um, good theatrical release back then I think didn't it? Yeah, I think it it, it actually won two awards um, in in Spain. Um, Best film, best director at the Malaga International Week of Fantastic Films uh, or Fantastic mm. Cinema, um, yeah. and and the only DVD that I found of the film was is actually um, a Spanish DVD, so it, it seems to have quite a fan base in in Spain. I think that's interesting. Well, it's almost like a cult film, right? So it it would it would pick itself up like a cult film, where just like the you know some of these films that that they never die they just they have a, a following um certain times of the year and they mm -hmm. keep they keep repeating them over and over again so and they never die these these some of these films uh you know rocky shore uh, rocky uh rocky horror picture show things like that have, have always been the cult type cult films mm -hmm. you know so um that wouldn't surprise me uh in that respect uh, because that was a very unique film in the sense that i think the money that was put into the eight millimeter side of it as well um, to get that look was was extremely uh, well done, I think. Mm. Yeah, like I said, it's it's one of the amazing sequences. I think those two big sequences, the one, the eight millimeter scene, um, the found footage from the 1930s mm -hmm. and um, the one with the haunted house that we were talking about earlier. I think mm -hmm. those two um, set pieces really, they make the film. I mean, those are, um, and I think again, they're very influential on, on what is, what's come afterwards in, in the genre. Sure. Um, when you came on board um, of the film, um, how far ahead was the project? Was there, is, were they still working on the script or? Um, no, I, we started from the beginning. I mean, I had a script, obviously, uh, as a producer, I got the script. Lucas ha had already started working on the storyboards. Um, well, actually it was Kit Wong was the director, but Lucas was looking at the story. I think she was working with her quite a bit during that. If I remember going back, um, he was kind of, because she was a newer director at that time. So she hadn't done a lot. So I think Lucas was kind of, uh, kind of mentoring her during that period of time. Um, but the script was already there. Um, the story was already there. It was just a question of when they brought me on, it was a question of um, logistically, they needed to stay in budget. They needed to, um, they needed to, you know, shoot locations. They needed to do, you know, and at that time, um, I had already established myself in the uh, film industry in Vancouver as well. So, um, the film commission in uh, the Vancouver Film Commission was aware of, um, it was just after that, that I did a lot more films in Vancouver. Um, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it was easy for me to, I knew my way around. I, I had lived there for a little bit of period of time anyway. So um, finding the locations was not a, a huge task, but Lucas, um, he, he was very much a director. He wasn't a, a producer. Um, he wanted to learn how to produce at the same time. Um, he needed somebody that could take him and make sure that this thing wasn't a failure. You know, <laughs> it wasn't, if it had, if Lucas had his way, he would have been well over budget. You know, he, he liked that because as an action director, you know, he, uh, he'd worked for Shaw Brothers uh, back in uh, Hong Kong and, you know, budgets were, you know, much like studio budgets. They were, you know, I mean, they weren't as big as, but, but put it this way you know i know that uh king of the kickboxers was shot in miami if i believe uh, in florida somewhere and that was a pretty huge budget there so that one he'd done that one so basically i taught him how to produce in that area and uh it was yeah it was quite a quite an experience um we had done it right from the from the script level right to the final you know i didn't go through the post part of it at all um, I was more contract producing in um, in Vancouver at the time, so that was what I did. Do you remember any discussions uh, during the whole process um, on um, the authenticity of of um, oh, the, the... absolutely? And that's the authenticity. Like I said, it couldn't have been. It couldn't have been. There, they spared no money on authenticity, making things look real. So that was where the focus of the film was. Mm -hmm. This had to look almost like you couldn't, like any, any naysayers would sit there and question their own selves. They'd say, well, maybe this is real, you know? Mm -hmm. 
um, because it was that it was that detailed. Everything down to the writing uh, of documents, um, reproducing documents, um, bringing in experts that had a writing style of the 20s or 30s, um, the, the the pens that were used back in the 30s. I remember I had to go looking for this stuff, and it was not easy to find. And uh, the um, but the detail, you know, uh, special inks um, that were virtually used in that period of time. So. Uh, so when you see those records in the black door and they're making reference to the records, these, these records were created from scratch. They were not just put in front of you saying, oh, here's some records and uh, that's the end of it. No, no, they were written by experts to actually recreate that. Wow. The paper, the paper was even um, weathered in, in a process to make it look back then. Yeah, they, they spared no expense on that film at that point. I find that a very interesting approach. It's almost um, like a forgery in a way that, um, sure. I mean, film obviously always does that film. Yeah. I mean, unless you're doing a fantasy film, but obviously you're creating props and sets and everything and it's supposed to look real. But in the found footage genre, um, it, it sort of takes another step towards pretending to be real i mean you're selling it as as real footage in a yeah. way so yeah. I, I think the forgery aspect of it is is, is really interesting <laughs> sure and i mean i don't know i can't recall exactly um i know certain things had to be on that those records and the rest was just blah 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 i think um i'm not i can't recall exactly the conversations that were taking place and what needed to be on it but even you take a look at the photographs I go back to the photographs that are shown um from in that film those photographs were shot of the actors and they had to be weathered and, and recreated to be that the 20s mm -hmm. or 30s so there was a process they spent a lot of money on that process and uh in the post side of it they did the post um i think back in hong kong i didn't they didn't do the post in vancouver so i only got as far as the final um shooting of the film and that was it and mm -hmm. then they took everything with them so um, I'm sure the, the post uh, production side of it uh, would have been uh, unique as well. They yeah. must have. Spent... I think it was edited by Alan Poon, who also edited um, yeah. Lucas Lowe's other films. Uh, sure, yeah. No, yeah. Lucas had the relationship. That's why they brought him in. Uh, Lucas did. You know, they brought Lucas in mm -hmm. because they knew he had this smooth style of, um, of kind of an action, uh, and they trusted him, obviously, with films he'd done before. Yeah, so it was uh, it was quite the unique experience in that film. Yeah, it was, and and when you look at the connection between, you know, the uh, uh, Legends of the Bushwalker uh, and uh, Neil Fredericks going to, um, then the the um, uh, Blair Witch, and then the Black Door comes out of left field, and then I end up doing that one as well. So uh, I didn't do the Black Door. Our, um, uh, the uh, Blair Witch, obviously, but Neil was the connection between mm. the first film uh, that I we did and um, and the Black Door. So jumping from um, Diaries of Darkness to the Black Door, and then having that influence in between the uh, um, the Blair Witch is uh, very very timely. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> What do you remember about the writers of, of The Black Door? Um, Laurent Courtiot and Julien Cabot, I, I think that those are the names. Yeah, they were, I think they were French. Um, I know that the, um, the uh, camera crew was from France. Mm -hmm. that, that I do know. I, I don't know. The writers were on set. Um, I didn't have much to do with the writers. Uh, we were more worried about... Um, um dealing with the production itself so the writers uh, dealt with kit, kit wong i'm sure lucas had conversations with them on a regular mm -hmm. basis because he he would have been um working with kit uh, during that period of time so um but they but the interesting thing about <laughs> the interesting thing about that film i know that you just sparked another memory um, was that because they were from French, they needed tea time in the afternoon <laughs> for about an hour and a half. We had to shut down and it was such a costly element. Um, 
<laughs> that uh, that they just wouldn't shoot during that period of time. They 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 needed their tea time or whatever it was that they had there. There there in France they have this afternoon um, this afternoon period where they they break for tea. And uh, I'm not you know I do remember that it was at the worst times. We we're sitting there trying to get a shot in, and nope, can't do it. There there we we're down for an hour and a half. And meanwhile, you're looking at the crew and you're looking at the, the cost of the crew and you're saying, oh, my God, we're not going to get out of here. You know, you got and you got, you know, you got crews that are working, even though they're non-union, they're still kind of looking at the clock going, you know, wait a minute, we're going into 12 hours here. What's going on? You know, and nobody, you know, so when they're going on their hour and a half uh, and you got no camera people, um, I think a couple of times, I think Lucas picked up the camera on a couple of those occasions and, and helped Kit do some shooting or shot some 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 parts of it. I don't know. I, I didn't see it, but I did know that that was one of my biggest uh, one of my biggest uh, things that I had never dealt with a, a crew from France. So I had no idea. You know, I understand that, you know, there's different, you know, they have different. It'd be like having a siesta in the middle of Mexico. Uh, <laughs> you're in the middle of a shooting and they want to have a siesta for two hours and you're sitting there looking at your clock and you're going, you know, at uh, uh, 45 crew members at, uh, you know, so much per hour and you're looking at a siesta. I mean, <laughs> that could be pretty expensive, I would imagine. So, and, I, and of course, as a producer, my concern is budget, staying on budget. So getting the thing shot in a, in a time period, right? Yeah, I can see how that can drive you crazy, but I, I like that. It's such a leisurely way of, of yeah, yeah. I no, mean, I, I didn't mind is it. always so hectic. I think that yeah, yeah and I get it. I get it for for such a yeah. break. I think that's that's kind of sweet. Yeah. I, I it was kind of something that I had never saw coming until it happened. Like I never even even thought about that because you know I was shooting in Los Angeles and shooting, um, in a, now shooting something with a French a French camera crew, a full French French camera crew. Um, which was very unique. I, I, th I thought they were very good. Um, and I liked their, their ability to have detail and they worked on detail quite a bit. So um, they were very, uh, very easy to deal with, very nice to deal with, but there's that tea time. <laughs> <laughs> But it's such an interesting combination uh, of like such an international crew. You were shooting in Vancouver. You have mm -hmm. people from Hong Kong involved. You have people sure. from France um, involved. Sure. How was the communication on set? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think there was a problem with anything. I think we all, um, everybody communicated. But it was such a busy set that I remember mm -hmm. because we were, you know, you had um, you had a, uh, a a B crew going off to shoot establishing shots somewhere else and you had the um the main crew shooting in the in the haunted house and then um you know there was a couple of other things where we had to take over um we had to take over a a, a cabin they shot part of it in a cabin if i remember correctly um and i had a babysit and that, that's another whole story they had to babysit this um this uh this other ranch oh not a ranch it was a farm um, just outside of Vancouver, about maybe, well, I'm going to say 30, 30 kilometers, 35 kilometers, um, 40 miles, or 35 miles, not kilometers, but 35 miles. And the interesting thing about that, it had a um, big cabin they wanted to shoot in, which was fine. So we, the people were put up uh, in a hotel that owned the property. Now, the interesting thing about that particular, uh, that set was, it had an other house that people lived in and they were building this cabin. It was, I think, 10,000 square feet, huge thing. And just by chance, they also had a tiger and the tiger had its own cage. It was a huge cage. It was like, it was from the, um, it was from the um, Calgary Zoo, I believe. It, they raised it as a baby, but now it's a 700 pound, um, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, not a Bengal tiger, but a, uh, Oh, um, Siberian tiger mm -hmm. and two buffalo. And, uh, and the buffalo would just roamed on the, on the property, but the tiger had its own huge cage. And this tiger was, you know, it was declawed, but nobody told me when I was babysitting the house, because I was waiting for the crews to get back. And I had to babysit the house that this tiger actually had a dog door and it came into the house. <laughs> so I'm sitting there watching TV waiting for the crew to get back 
And just kind of my, that was kind of my semi office. And this tiger comes in into the, the t- same tiger that they, inter- that they showed me. Here's how you feed him. You put live chickens in and he can only eat live chickens. And he goes up in the tree and he dives at them. Like there's a tree in his cage. Like it's how big the cage is. And now I see this tiger coming into the living room. And I'm going, what? <laughs> oh, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? This is not good. <laughs> and you know how when cats purr, they go, you know, you know, this thing growls. And so you don't know if it's, I didn't know that when I first saw it come in. And I'm the only one in this, in this living room. Watch, I'm just watching TV waiting for people. And this thing walks in and it starts walking towards me. And I go, what am I going to do? I can't go anywhere. And, and so this thing walks right up to me. And it puts his head, I had my feet up on this uh, hassock thing, and it puts his head on, on my, my legs, like it wants to be pet. And I'm thinking, do I pet this thing? What is it doing? I have no idea. So I, I put the, uh, I kind of just ignored it for a little bit. And then I figured, I started kind of, I couldn't help because it was so, it was so furry. I just wanted to see exactly what a tiger's head felt like. And if it was going to eat me, he's going to eat me. But I'm too late at this point anyway. So I, I take my hand and I kind of put it and, and my head goes all the way up to, um, right up to my wrist. That's how thick his fur was not on his head. And I, so I start, and he starts kind of purring, like growling purring. That's what they do. Right. And he liked it. Right. So so then he lays down on the floor next to me and we watched TV, him and I together for about an hour and a half, two hours. And I realized he has a dog door. Nobody told me that the dog, the thing came into the, into the, uh, um, into the house, but apparently they treat it like a pet and it comes into the house. It was not, it didn't escape from the cage. It just has a dog door that goes into the cage. And, uh, but uh, something like that, you think you would have told me about um that that would be an important information yeah i think so (laughs) you would think so but um and strangely enough when i was when i was petting the tiger and then it would roll over and i I was rubbing his belly right it wanted me to rub his belly but it had no it had no claws but it had teeth those Mm. teeth were still pretty huge um and i remember i was rubbing behind its ear it it turned around and grabbed my hand real fast like don't do that Mm. (laughs) but i said but he didn't penetrate me at all just grabbed me very fast um, and told me, you know, basically letting me know that mm-hmm. don't do that. So I just, I just kind of was very respectful of, you know, he wanted his belly rubbed and things like that. But uh, that was a 750 pound uh, tiger. <laughs> so, I mean, so him and me became good friends. Uh, and eventually he went back to his cage and I had to feed him. So I had to put some live chickens in there. And this thing went right up under the top of the, uh, he went right up on the top of the tree inside the, and it's a big tree. It's not like, this is not a small cage. This is a huge cage. And this thing would dive on these chickens. It was just like incredible, right? Right across the whole cage almost. So this thing was airborne for quite a while <laughs> before it hit the ground. But that was, that was a very different experience too. That's a, and the, and of course the buffalo would torment it. It would, buffalo would go up to the cage and kind of walk right by and that tiger wanted to go as buffalo so badly. And so he would he would jump at the cage and just kind of sit on the side of the cage and he would just let them know when I get out, I'm getting you. <laughs> so that was that was the other experience on that film. I remember that now. So that was another that was another interesting uh, experience. <laughs> it's certainly not in the job description for a producer. No, no, it I wasn't. Think. <laughs> no, and and as I did some research into the people, I mean, the people told me they had these things or they showed me the tiger and all that. And just told me how to feed it and things like that. They didn't say it comes into the house, uh, um, but that apparently they got it as a baby in the uh, in the Calgary Zoo, which is in in Alberta, and that was they raised it as a uh, as a tiger, as um, an adult, but they raised it as a pet. Uh, uh-huh. Oh, and and the, oh yeah, the mother that believed the tiger believed they had a poodle, a little <laughs> poodle, which was a, a, a mini poodle or something, and that was its mother. That's what the tiger thought was its mother. So if the poodle came and started barking at the tiger, the tiger com- complied. <laughs> it was very interesting. The tiger, the actual poodle would send it back to the cage. It was, I don't know. It's such a surreal image. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You had to, be, you had to live it. Believe me. Um, 
Uh, and, and nobody was there. I was babysitting that place where I was waiting for the cruise to get back. They were in three different places of uh, the lower mainland in, in the Vancouver area. And I and so I was by myself with this thing. And they didn't get back till I think 11 o'clock that night. And I'm sitting there with this tiger, um, you know, becoming its best friend. I don't know whether it's its best friend for dinner or whether it's best friend, period. But <laughs> I, I, it seemed very friendly in that respect. But, hey, it is a wild animal. You never know, right? So... <laughs> But that's the first time I actually had actually spent some time with a tiger and actually got to play with it. So that was that was quite a life experience. Never, never had that happen again in my life anywhere. <laughs> I think not a lot of people can tell that kind of story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it was pretty it was pretty surreal. Let me tell you. Uh, so uh, so that film had a lot of interesting things go on with it. Trust me, mm. um, that had a that every day was a different day in that film. So. It's, now I'm almost disappointed that the tiger doesn't appear in the film too. <laughs> well, I, I I think if they would have if they would have seen it, you know, interestingly enough, a lot of people didn't go in that house. Only a few of the crew got to go in that house that I was in because that was kind of my office at that point. Mm -hmm. So really, they had no reason to be in there except for um, when we'd have uh, meetings and things, and I made sure that that door downstairs was locked for the tiger because I don't <laughs> think they and they would never have had any any connection with that tiger so um so that's uh, interesting in that respect uh, that uh, i got to i got to spend time with it so it was uh, it was an interesting tiger <laughs> you know but that was i still think of that today you know people ask me what's my most bizarre experience i've ever had and and that's usually the story that i'll come up with mm -hmm. because that that was just caught me out of left field totally <laughs> I think that I actually felt I actually felt bizarre. I felt I was going to die. I actually felt I was going to mm. die that moment when it first came out because I had I thought it got in by accident. And maybe he hadn't eaten and maybe I'm dinner. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so that was a so that was a very interesting uh, part of that film that was there. But it, it, there was a lot of interesting things with that film that actually went on. I think back on it. Um, and uh, like I said, they didn't spare a lot of expense on mm -hmm. you know they spent money on the things they should have spent money on and the detail the detail was amazing um in that film that's one thing i do give them 100 credit for because that's what i think made it so so popular mm -hmm. yeah a lot of films would have just kind of you know cheated it and said okay let's just use this and that mm -hmm. and that uh, you know because especially when they saw the budgets of having to get that stuff done from detail but uh i know kid wong was very um was very uh uh, adamant about the fact that she wanted certain things um done exactly that way and that hey i had no problem with that you want to pay for it i'll get it done <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about kid wong as a director she's very nice i i do know that i mean i don't know much else i mean she was pretty much with her crew most of the time the only time him uh her and i would have conversations um most of the time lucas was with her so he he was mm -hmm. kind of with her most of the time um, and he was one of the producers as well. So um, only time that they would come in um, to talk to me is if Lucas came in and he was asking me a question uh, about certain things they could do. And Kit may have asked me a few more questions that she wants to do this. I know she was very adamant about certain things had to be done a certain way. Um, she she wasn't going to um, she wasn't going to stop at you know cutting things out, but everything had to be done specifically. And she's very detailed that way. And as a result of it, the film became amazing. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of feedback did you get um, about the film? Um, I mean, other than you know what I just said that, for example, it had it, it won awards in in Spain, for example. Um, did, did you hear back from people um, who saw the film? No, you know what? I, actually, it was just it was kind of on my roster of producer of, as as a producer. Um, I did a lot of. Um, because I had also a company in Vancouver that I did a lot of um, a lot of independent films. So I, I did so many of them uh, as an executive producer that I was kind of, I, you know, I looked at this as it was another film that Lucas wanted me to get involved in. Um, but I really didn't get a lot of, it's not like the internet what it was like it was today. Um, the internet, you know, I mean, they, wa they went with the film back to Hong Kong, uh, I really never heard anything more of it. 
Um, mm-hmm. And then Lucas disappeared, I think, the next year um, after that. So really, I got out of the film industry, uh, I think, doing what I was doing in Vancouver. I left, I think, in about 2007 myself and walked away from it and never went back to it until I started doing the uh, transition hole this year, um, looking at it as kind of a, a project that I, because I've never lost my interest in the writing, producing side of things. I always just kind of look at it now as kind of a something that uh, I'm writing now and just kind of don't know what I'll do with it, but um, kind of in the pandemic gave me an opportunity to spend some time kind of redoing and, and looking at projects I had done in the film industry and and revamping perhaps some things that I was, you mm. know, writing back then. And, you know, didn't know where I was really going with it, but just enjoyed the process because I always enjoyed the producing side of it. It was a nice, um, you know, I'd been a cop for 15 years. So for getting out of that business for a period of time, and I was doing some, at that particular time, I was also uh, writing a couple of books um, during that period of time as well that uh, ultimately I released. But uh, um, yeah, so so that, and but when it got to the point where I was not no longer doing film, um, that's where I was kind of uh, disillusioned, I guess, to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Had I gone into it when it was like now, I would have totally been under, you know, understood that market a lot better than I do film. Um, but you know, it's, it was a different time back then. And um, I enjoyed the stint that I did. Um, and, you know, uh, I produced also theater off Broadway. And, uh, you know, the creative side of it was very, um, very unique in the sense that I liked the creativity. It was very, it allowed you to, you know, be creative in a sense as well. So it was a total opposite to what my police career was at the time. And uh, I enjoyed having secondary things to do not just focusing on, you know, uh, one career, one thing. Um, and this was an, uh, this was a great, uh, you know, a great thing um, to do. So, mm-hmm. so I, so that's kind of how I got into it and, and uh, um, kept it going for a while for about 10 years total, I think it was in the film industry. So, mm-hmm. uh, and like I say, now it's just a question of, you know, I still, I still dabble in it, but not, you know, in a full-time way, so. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that um, Lucas went back to Hong Kong and that he disappeared. Um, do you have any idea of what, what happened there? Does, what you know, happened? it's interesting because I know that he had, um, he was living in Vancouver. I used to go to his place all the time. His, he has a family, he had a wife, a couple of kids, I think. Um, and, um he had told me one day that he's because uh, I he was taking some of the stuff from the um, uh, diaries to to Hong Kong to have it. Uh, um, I forget exactly what he was doing with it, but he was getting something done with it there. And um, I waited for him to get back. And uh, of course, not in those days. It's you had cell phones, but you didn't have the technology we have today where you could. Um, you could zoom or you could do whatever you wanted to do just to, you know, get a hold of somebody face to face. Um, and I kind of waited and waited and, uh, tried to reach out to, um, I think I talked to his wife once and she said, well, he's not back. I haven't heard from him. And, and eventually it just got to the point where he never came back. And then I had some connections, um, of people that he knew in Hong Kong, they said, they've never heard of me either. And, this, and then we, a few years have gone by. And mm-hmm. um, I ran into a couple of people uh, from uh, his, people that knew him. And they said, have you, have you heard from Lucas? We haven't heard from him anywhere. And I thought, hmm. that's very bizarre. You know, whether, whether he had taken a different wife, whether he had gone, I don't know what the deal was. You know, it's just, he just disappeared and never heard hide nor hair of him. And he would have got a hold of me um at some point because i mean we were pretty good friends we we'd worked on quite a few films together and uh um but i had i haven't heard from never have since then so and if you look at um at his imdb i i don't think he's done anything else i haven't looked at it recently but Mm, i don't think he's on doing anything so he's pretty much his his it ended as diaries right i think that's yeah diaries and the black door those are the last and the black door that yeah. yeah Yeah. So those, yeah. So that's, yeah. So it's nothing to be found at that point. So, uh, Mm. 
hard to uh, uh, hard to tell whatever happens. Mm. <laughs> that's going to be a, that's a that's a mystery in itself. <laughs> <laughs> For the next uh, yeah, movie that yeah, you're going to yeah. write. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe he just dropped out and and sort of started a new life, but uh, well, not as a filmmaker. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, you never know. I mean, you know, the world's a big place and, uh, you, mm. you know, you you don't want to be found. You don't have to be found if you don't want to be. I don't know what the, you know, some people just disappear. They don't want to be found. So they change their name and they they just move on with life. Mm -hmm. But I mean, he is pretty high profile. So, I mean, in the in the world of of filmmakers, I mean, you know, he he had quite a quite a, a huge lot of films that are quite watched even to this day. Mm. yeah i you think know. so too i mean with films like king of the kickboxers which is a cult classic in its own right um, sure. i think a lot of people certainly tried to track him down to get in touch with him to yeah. talk to him about it um sure. and well yeah that's and you know that's an interesting point too because i mean um the connection with him and billy blanks for example that was in king of the kickboxer mm -hmm. uh billy blanks well you know it was a you know a major actor in hollywood and you know i mean we kind of all got to know each other when i was in uh we used to go down to his gym in studio city when he was doing taibo um before the taibo thing the crave took off and he became um you know and i dealt with his agency um billy's agency kazarian spencer in los angeles and then he was he moved on to william morris but i mean he would have definitely had contacts because mm. lucas really liked billy and, and they would have had contacts um so i don't know have no idea what actually happened mm. so uh, but like i say when i left the film industry uh, about 2007 2008 um basically i had no reason to go looking past that and mm. uh, you know kind of moved on and now we are here we are in 2022 um <laughs> and uh well, you tracked me down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that's, uh, and that's, and one of the reasons is because of a book I put out, but, uh, um, and that's interesting because it was, uh, um, a book that I had uh, written was used in a film, uh, Fight Valley. So, um, so they use the concepts of what I do for a living. So, mm -hmm. so that's an interesting connection, all intertwined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, it's, uh, I think those connections are always a, a very interesting part of sure. how, how the world works. Um, and yeah, I mean, the film is uh, 21 years old, I think, or yeah. 20 years old. I think it came out in 2000 or 2001. Yeah, 2001, I think. 2001, yeah. so yeah, um, 20 years old now. So, um, I mean, and it's it, still, and it's still uh, like it's on YouTube. So, I mean, I found it on YouTube. Uh, the black door so um the so it's it's being watched somewhere mm -hmm. yeah i would hope for a for a proper release um, like i said the only dvd that i found is from spain and that's out of print so it's mm -hmm. quite expensive actually it does have an english soundtrack on it um, oh, it doesn't yeah, yeah. it was shot in english so yeah uh, but yeah. sometimes, you know, the, the Spanish DVD only has a Spanish uh, dub on it. Well, um, in, in delivery requirements for most, you know, in most countries, when you're doing delivery, you have to, there's certain requirements that each each country requires yeah. for doing delivery. So you have to, you know, as a dis, as the distributor needs to have it ready for delivery in that particular country. So, so it's just like any film, I guess. But uh, I don't know. I'd like to see the um, the uh, English version. Actually, would have been interesting to see again, mm -hmm. because actually one of the actors in the Black Door, and I can't even remember his name, um, but he plays one of the main roles in the twenties or in the thirties footage. Um, mm -hmm. He's one of the guys that is in the photos. He's uh, a young guy back then, but uh, I remember that actually made his career as an actor. He actually he connected with me after and um had an agent and got himself some pretty good work so um that film actually got him launched his career so i don't even remember his name but i know that um, um his agent was a pretty big agent in in vancouver mm -hmm. at that time so so i think a lot of the um canadian actors that were in that footage part of it um their careers kind of took off a little bit mm -hmm. so it's kind of interesting how these things happen because it was a you know and even back then it was um the, you know, when it first came out, I think the criticism was, oh, they're just a copy of the Black, or of the uh, the Blair Witch. 
but in essence, they were different in a lot of ways yeah. in how they were, you know, but, but, you, you know, hindsight's 2020. So you can go back and say, but then it becomes, you know, a cult classic in people, you know, wanting that footage that those found footage films. So, um, you know, these are very interesting things that happen. You don't see them happening until 20 years later. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think that applies to a lot of a, a lot of movies where um, at the moment they're released, they're sort of lumped in together with some mm -hmm. other movie that's successful at the moment. And I mean, we talked about how the Blair Witch sort of started the Black Door, but um, I totally agree. Those are two different films. And sure. I mean, nowadays, now that the found footage genre is, is you know, 20 years old basically or, or yeah. even older if you take some of the precursors um you look at a film that was made right at the beginning um and you see how some of the ideas started and how people were dealing with those ideas i think that's a very interesting um mm -hmm. experience and a, a, a very interesting um area of study i think to yeah to, but to keep see. in mind that also you got you got technology that was changing over the time too mm -hmm. so during the time of the blair witch um, and, and it was also the way people were looking at film back then. Um, you look at Blair Witch was the, was the breakthrough film that actually created um, created a new way of looking at film that it, and they just couldn't swallow it yet. Um, that's why Artesian picked it up because they saw they saw the bigger picture where nobody saw that. They saw it as a film that could be great because it had, it had a likability to it, but it just, nobody had ever done it before. And just like in the film industry prior to that, everybody was doing the same things over and over and over again, whether it was, you know, if you had Volcano coming out in the studios, you had Dante's Peak. You had, uh, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, movies where people are blowing up, um, you know, like you got the disaster, disaster movies, right? And everybody, every studio keeps one or two of them on the shelf ready to go in the event somebody else has got one. So that's kind of the producer way of looking at things. And um, but, you know, when you have something like like a Blair, a Blair Witch or a Black Door, how do you you know, it, it's a question of now the people have to say whether they like it or not. It's a risky element to put out there if you don't know what the response is going to be. But that's why we have film festivals. They usually can tell you what the what the response is going to be. And so in the in the you know the uh, i think i think it was a very um innovative way to have the um to have the the blair witch project because it was exactly that much like when i shot um legends of the bushwalker um originally the legends of the bushwalker was supposed to be like campfire tales the the series campfire tales um that's kind of where my my um uh, I was inspired through that. The way it's shot is you've got one person, and that's why in the the one sheet I sent you, there's a picture of the bushwalker sitting around the mm -hmm. campfire, and he's telling stories, and it cuts away to these different stories. That's ultimately how it was going to be, and then we scrapped that idea when we went into the series itself. But that was what it originally. So it starts off shooting what you see there, and those are actually stills from the actual uh, film but are in this series, but it's, um, it's a campfire. Uh, uh, the bushwalker is a guy that was walking across the, the uh, plain or across the mountains. And he sits when he, the campfire and he tells stories. And these stories are all kind of like the, um, similar to the twilight zone type, not, I didn't want to get into the horror horror. I wanted to do something that was more intelligent and you didn't see the ending coming. Mm -hmm surprise endings are i it's kind of the way i like to write it's i don't i always um bring you down a path where you don't know what's going to end up happening but then something totally different happens mm -hmm. the unknown is what i like writing so that's kind of the style i like and the interesting thing about <laughs> speaking of diaries when i was writing diaries um when i was in los angeles one of the things i had a problem of is when i was writing the episodes is i couldn't focus and so, so what I did was, um, I, I, every time I was writing an episode, I'd get on the train, um, like the uh, Amtrak mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and I'd go to New Mexico. And, 
<laughs> and it was a turnaround. So I would go to New Mexico and then I'd wait two hours and come back on the same train overnight. So they were overnight trips there. And that's where I wrote after every episode. <laughs> I wrote it in the bar car, actually. <laughs> So I'd set up, I, 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 I had a, a room, I'd get a room overnight in the, on the train, but I found it so quiet and inspirational mm -hmm. that that's how I was able to write the, the episodes. <laughs> that's a really cool setting for, for writing something. It is. Writing actually, story. actually it is. It's actually, it allowed me to say here, you're starting to write today. You get on the train, you go get a couple of drinks, you sit in the bar car, you're by yourself most of the time, and you just start working on it. Mm -hmm. And so you still have that you, movement forward. Uh, yeah, know. just it, it's so, something about it. I, I was able to be inspired. Everything that you see, even in the pilot, in the, uh, the one sheet I gave you for the series, mm -hmm. um, all that was written on the train. <laughs> and I... I have no idea why that was so inspiring, but I did it for every episode that I wrote. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was it, and it was perfect because it was, I got off in, um, what is, I can't remember the, it was the capital of New Mexico, but I would get off in, in that town, in that city, and it was two hour wait to, to the train going the other way. So I would get off, do some shopping or whatever, get back on the train and I'd write the rest of it going back. So half of it was written going there and half of it written coming back. And then when I, I got to the end, it was done. Perfect. Yeah. But you go across the, you know, you go across the desert in some cases and, and mm -hmm. just in the morning at 6 AM, you just totally inspiring. You're, you're, you're seeing the, the red mountains or the red uh, foothills or whatever those mm -hmm. things are called. We're in the desert and, it just is so inspiring that I just, I just, everything was pouring out of me writing wise. Mm -hmm. I can, so. I can, yeah, I can understand that. Um, yeah. I think the combination I of, of solitude and, you know, being on the road, so to speak, and then seeing yeah. the different movement. sorts of landscapes and everything. Yeah. I think and the that, movement of the train just, yeah. it, it kind of goes back and forth, back and forth, kind of like rocking you to, to mm -hmm. kind of uh, shaking, shaking ideas out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, so that was the other thing that uh, that I always was inspired. That's that's when I wrote every episode. Is I took so many different train trips to that same, um, you know, to New Mexico all the time, and it was it was perfect because it was a it was a I took get a round trip ticket, get a bedroom, um, so I'd work till about two in the morning, one in the morning, go to sleep, get up, have breakfast, crossing the desert. Um, and then I had more ideas and I'd go back in the bar car and start writing again. That's yeah. perfect. I got to try this. Um, I've tried oh, yeah. writing, I've tried writing on an airplane, which doesn't work at all. No. Um, no. just only if you have to, I mean, you sort of try and spend your time productively. Um, yeah. but on a train, I usually read when, when I'm on a train, um, yeah. but I have no, to I, try writing. The train is, the train is literally the place to go and actually be creative. I, mm -hmm. I found anyway. And I found if I sat in an office, if I sat in my office or um, in Los Angeles, I just couldn't. Uh, I was in I was in uh, uh, Century Park, and I just couldn't get inspired to write when I was there. So I had to go to the train, and I'd buy a ticket round trip, get a room, um, worth the money to go and write your script, and that's <laughs> it. Nobody bothers you. you. And back in those days, you didn't have the cell phones you have today. You know, you didn't have people bugging you on a regular basis. And if I did it again, I would shut everything off. Mm -hmm. I'm out of, I'm out of touch. Yeah, for, I think that's a good, very good idea when you're writing to just, uh, yeah. you know, keep the world. Yeah, shut everything off and don't check emails, um, Wi-Fi or not. Just start writing and focus on a different environment. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that became my creative, my, I almost, it worked every time, so. I uh, I could become very creative in that in that sense, so it was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So when you reworked the um, transition hole episodes, uh, did you do that on a train too? No, unfortunately, I couldn't do them on a train with the pandemic. Yeah. I, I I'd rather that would be too too stressful to do that. So mm -hmm. I I would rather just sit in the office and do that. So um, no, I did I did them, but it, but it's because I'm going back to doing what I used to do. It, it's got a creative element to it anyway, and. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, going back to some of the ideas I had back then and, and, and it didn't take long for them to kind of prompt me into writing again. Um, and actually, I, I think I'm even more creative today than I was back then because mm -hmm. I've lived longer. <laughs> 20 years older <laughs> so but when you're older you've got uh, you've got more experience you've seen more mm -hmm. um and your ideas i think are more developed in the sense mm -hmm. that you can you can think outside the box a little bit easier mm -hmm. i think so too especially the, the the life experience part of it i think that makes sure. yeah. uh, a huge difference yeah that's why when you're writing a book when you're 24 versus when you're writing a book when you're 50 or 55 mm -hmm. it's a different book absolutely yeah yeah even if even if it's a fiction it's a different book because you understand the ideas that can that can actually happen you you you're more complex as a person than you can write more complex mm -hmm. Yeah, you also relate, I think, to other ideas um, and other notions within the characters, other feelings. Um, I mean, in your 20s, you never think about how, well, I don't know, how life's going to end at some point or sure. yeah. uh, the things that you've lost, uh, the things, opportunities that you might have missed, sure. stuff like that. Um, yeah, which and yeah. Comes you're very, I think you're very two-dimensional um, when you're a younger writer and you're three-dimensional as you get older. Mm. I think you just... I think you become more um, complex in your way of writing, um, where you you're covering certain things you wouldn't have thought to cover when you were younger because you didn't have that life experience. Mm -hmm. So there's certain things that you can address in a book um, when you're writing, or even in a script when you're writing that you wouldn't have addressed when you were younger because you didn't have the life experience. Mm -hmm.